Fala pessoal, tudo bom? Trevor aqui com mais um vídeo para o canal Relógio Sem Fronteiras, voltando aí para as nossas entrevistas. Hoje vou estar falando, como vocês acabaram de ver, com o Managing Director da Raqueta, David Henderson Stewart. Realmente foi uma honra, uma conversa sensacional que durou quase uma hora. Então peço que assistam porque tocamos é, sobre vários assuntos dentro da relojoaria, muitos assuntos atuais, né, pertinentes à Rússia, devido à situação que, a gente, que eles estão passando. Mas mesmo assim... Uma conversa sensacional, porque deu para perceber que, independente de qual país, de qual desenvolvimento a indústria relojoeira tem, muitos dos valores, dos conceitos, são mantidos. Eu acredito que é, isso está sendo realmente fantástico, essa percepção é, dessa narrativa histórica, cultural e artística que todos os países tentam manter na, na sua indústria. E não é uma tarefa fácil, como a gente vai ver agora na entrevista. Pessoal, se vocês gostam do canal, por favor, deixem seu like canal, a gente está batalhando aqui para tentar difundir e promover os conceitos da urologia, é, novas marcas, novos mercados, novas iniciativas, então espero que vocês gostem do vídeo, espero que vocês deixem seu like, deixem seus comentários, assinem o canal, curte a entrevista aí pessoal, obrigado. Stuart, thank you very much uh, for speaking with me today, we had a bit of a few technical issues, so thank you for your patience. It's on, fine, uh, it's fine. On this Monday, uh, Monday afternoon for you, it's uh, 10 o'clock here in São Paulo. So, how's how's your day going? Busy, busy uh, start of the week. What's the week like for you at uh, in Moscow with Raketa? Uh, well, in, in, uh, on our side, the day is nearly finished. Uh, it's already nearly five o'clock p.m. But um, and it's, it's always very exciting. I mean, I love my work. Um, for me, it's not, I, I wouldn't even call it work. It's so interesting. It's about culture, know-how, uh, craftsmanship, uh, telling interesting stories about space, about submariners, art. So uh, I'm always very excited uh, on Monday mornings. And um, are you working on something specific at the moment? Is there um, any projects that you're working on? Well, we just released last week. Um, a new model with a new case, which is called Raketa Ekrana Plan Watch. And that's a big success, uh, both in Russia and outside Russia. It's a really cool watch that tells a story about uh, this amazing uh, Soviet... Uh, um, it's not an aircraft, it's not a ship, it's something, something in between. And they produced one exper experimental um, sample and it's just lying now on the beach in on the Caspian Sea. It's really extraordinary. And basically, Uh, based on that, we did an incredible watch, like a pilot's watch a bit, but it's 24 hours, and I would just release that last week. Fantastic. Yeah, I saw some of that on social media, so congratulations on that release. Uh, so, you mentioned you are in, in Moscow, because I know the, the, the factory is in, uh, in St. Saint, in Saint Petersburg, and I would like to talk about the factory in a minute, but um, what are the dynamics? I mean, do you have to go to the factory often? Do you commute a lot between the bo both cities? Yeah, I mean, St. Petersburg and Moscow are very close to each other. It's um, by by plane, it's an hour. Uh, so it's not so far. So I go to the factory maybe once a month. But otherwise, I'm in contact with them every single day by, by Google Meet or by Zoom. That's very convenient. But uh, frankly speaking, the factory is doing very well uh, as it is. So I, I, at the very beginning of the project, that was 10 years ago, I, I spent a lot of, when I was sending my family back to Europe, I, I stayed in Russia and I moved to St. Petersburg and I lived at the factory, uh, basically. But I didn't have to do that anymore because in 10 years, we really, uh, we modernized the factory. Uh, we bought new machines. We hired new people. We created our own watchmaker school. So now the, work, the factory works very well by itself. It doesn't need to be really supervised as it used to. And uh, we have 120 people working at the factory in St. Petersburg. So they produce the watches. And on our side in Moscow, we have the design studio, the creative studio, as we call it. And we have approximately 20 people working in the creative studio. It's all of the design, the marketing. So basically, we design the watches in Moscow. We send the design drawings to St. Petersburg. They make out of it a 3G model. Uh, then we start quarreling with them because we say, uh, uh, we want to do it like that. And they say, your case is too thick. And finally, we reach a compromise, and then they do a sample. And basically, because we are in contact all the time. And the factory, then, if we, uh, we can talk a little about that, there's a lot of history on the um, on Raketa's factories. Actually, is it the oldest factory in Russia? Uh, 
It's the Which oldest it? legally incorporated company factory that still exists today. It was incorporated as a legal entity uh, more than 300 years uh, ago by the Emperor Peter the Great. Basically, the Emperor, the Emperor Peter the Great is really the Emperor that who took out Russia from the Middle Ages into the modern Russia. So he's a very big emperor. And so he uh, he founded the factory and this legal entity has been existing for existing from insisted for more than 300 years now. And you're still on the same site, still the same location. He, uh, nearly, nearly. The original building still exists. It's 300 meters away from our current building. Um, uh, but uh, it's very close. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Uh, and, 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 and for 300 years, it has worked non-stop. Non-stop. That's unbelievable. Yeah. And it was also the um, the first location where Raketa started back in 1960. I don't want to get it wrong. In 1961. 1961. 1961. So, so the factory is 300 years old, but the brand Raketa, we had other brands before that, but the brand Raketa was created in 1961 when the Soviets sent the very first man into space. That was Yuri Gagarin. And that was such an incredible event for humanity that they decided to create a brand in honor of this, you know, incredible achievement, human achievement. And so they created the brand Raketa, which means a space rocket in Russian. So, and you mentioned that you have a school for watchmakers because I was in Russia recently. I was fortunate enough to go to Russia recently. And I already knew the, obviously, um, some of the history that Russia has in watchmaking, some of the brands. Um, I was lucky to, to, to meet quickly with uh, Konstantin Chaikin as well while I was in uh, in Moscow. And um, but I had no idea, you know, of the the the, the history, the scope, you know, that, that that how far it goes back. And um, and this is only Russia without in interference from other countries. I know Swiss watchmaking also very well established and very traditional, but Russia has its own history in watchmaking. So when you, today you say you have 120 people uh, in the factory, 20 in Moscow, do they go to training in Russia? Are they specialized in watchmaking? Because I think I'm just trying to ask is where do you get your staff uh, from? Because it's such a specialized um, workmanship and it is considering Raketa, the history, the legacy that it has, how do you hire, where do you find people to, to build the watches? Well, that, that's a very difficult, this is a very good question. And that's one of the most difficult parts in, um, in, in this project. Um, basically, we inherited a fully fledged manufacturer. In the Soviet times, uh, the Raketa manufacturer had more than 7,000 watchmakers working in the factory producing more than 5 million mechanical watches every single year. So there was a, a, a tremendous know-how. So when I first uh, uh, visited the factory 10 years ago in St. Petersburg, it was basically dying. But there were still 30 watchmakers that remained working in terrible conditions, but they, had, they still had all this incredible know-how in various departments. So we built on that. So there are no more watchmaking schools in Russia, um, but so we we opened our own watchmaking school, um, but we also kept all of these very old watchmakers who gradually, every single year, transfer all of their know-how to the younger generations. So that's how we do it. Uh, we cannot, unlike Switzerland, we cannot hire already trained watchmakers because they don't exist in Russia anymore, because there aren't any watchmaking schools. So we train them ourselves in our school and also in the departments where we where we still have every single old watch specialist that we keep in order to transmit all this incredible know-how. So from 30 very old watchmakers, we now have 120 watchmakers. So it works quite well. Fantastic. Yeah, no, fantastic. Keeping the legacy alive. And some this is one of the issues that we have in Brazil. I think Brazil doesn't have such a legacy on history on watchmaking. Um, we are more maybe a consumer-based market in a way. You know, population here, it's... Fantastic. The watchmaking industry is thriving in Brazil right now. But when it comes to production, um, we don't have so much legacy and also no, no, no schools. So what are what would be the main differences, you would say, between building a watch in Russia and building a watch in a more 
establish i don't say established but with a different history such as switzerland germany even you know with the uh with well all the legacy that it has and the big difference between russia and uh switzerland for example switzerland is a very stable country if you look at russia's history it has a lot of chaotic periods up ups and downs uh which um are very destructive uh in terms of brand building and uh manufacture building so what happened in the 80s, you had the perestroika and then the 90s when the Soviet Union collapsed. So um, basically, then a lot of watchmaking know-how has disappeared. But thank God, in, in our factory, it remains. So they kept all of the technical drawings, uh, all of the know-how um, with these 30 old watchmakers. And um, so they work. I mean, 10 years ago, they worked in very difficult conditions. And that was, the, to answer your question, that was the main, that's the main difference between Swiss watchmakers and the Russian watchmakers. Uh, I, 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 I shipped over to, to uh, St. Petersburg a lot of Swiss watchmakers to kind of help us at the beginning, because like many people in the world, I, I thought that only the Swiss could make proper watches, and I didn't really trust my Russian watchmakers. That was the biggest mistake I did, because the reality is that they're tremendously good. They're very, very good. And they're especially good in working in difficult conditions. And all of these Swiss watch specialists that I invited to come to St. work, they said, oh, I cannot work like that. You know, if everything is not absolutely perfect, the lighting, the temperature, the, the table, my chair, they, they just refuse to work. The Russian watchmaker, he just, you know, he, um, these people, are, are they've always had a difficult life and they're just work, uh, used to work in difficult conditions. And a lot of the Swiss watchmakers, they said, wow, it's amazing that uh, in in these conditions, you can make incredible watches at work. Wow. So um, I think uh, the conclusion is that sometimes in Switzerland, they just push it a bit too much in terms of um, uh, perfection. You, you can, yeah. uh, I mean, obviously, we're, 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 we're moving into this direction, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the Russians can work in, in different conditions than the Swiss. Yeah, That's a big difference. Absolutely. What about um, other countries? Do you have any dealings or any relationships with uh, China or Japan or um, that no. also, you know? No, no, because we, you know, um, we inherited like a fully fledged manufacturer. So we produce like 90% of the components that I have on my wrist and I have like nearly 300 components on my wrist we produce them in-house so we are very very much autonomous um we do obviously buy uh, components uh, or we sometimes import them but it's it's a tiny it's a very small percentage um uh, uh, most of the dealings i have are with switzerland uh over the past 10 years we did buy some machines in switzerland so i have a lot of contacts in switzerland but otherwise, even our machines are the very old Soviet machines. And that's what the Swiss love about us. And basically, we organized a lot of press tours where we invited a lot of uh, bloggers, watch journalists, specialists from Europe, mainly, and the Middle East. And they all said, all, they all said wow, it's amazing. You work um, like the Swiss worked 50 years ago. Uh, it's a very old school way of producing watches. And they said, please don't change that because it's amazing. There's a lot of... Uh, there's a human touch behind uh, in all of you. I mean, basically, the machines, we still set them by hand. We put the component by hand. We make them work by hand. It's a very semi-manual, old-school way of producing. We didn't have any CNC machines, you know, where you have programmers writing codes and the machine works by itself. No. Uh, and, and we want to keep that. So that's also a big difference between the way they work in Switzerland and the way we work. So, you, so you still have some of the old machinery, some of the old oh, yeah. tools from, oh, that, yeah, from oh, yeah. the Soviet, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, if you come to St. Petersburg to visit us, you will absolutely love it. Um, it's it's very old school, and basically, it brings a human touch to 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 watchmaking. You know, watchmaking is about human emotions, and in our factory, you still have a lot of human emotions because every single one of these components is produced by hand by a man or a woman. Um, and, it, uh, and it's really cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think I would imagine that the the sense of responsibility and history that each person has, you know, in their in their job, also is it's much more um, in it's much more alive 
you know, than just pressing a button or going to a, a, a conveyor belt with all the armed with electronic, uh, you know, uh, movements of uh, building a watch. So how many, uh, how many pieces uh, per year are you producing right now? Uh, so this year, I think we will reach 7,000 watches. Mm -hmm. So it's still very small compared to, you know, big brands. I mean, what we do is really, really amazing. I mean, we, we produce our own hair spring, for example. We produce our own escapement. Like every single component of the escapement, we produce ourselves. We wow. produce uh, every single one of our plates, of our wheels, of our pinions, uh, axi you know, everything. So it's very, very difficult. Uh, so it's uh, we're ramping up the production slowly because, you know, as you well know, the biggest enemy in watchmaking is to be in a hurry. So if, if, if I put too much pressure on the factory, can you produce more watches and we need more mechanical movements, more components, it will not end well because uh, everything has to be done very slowly and, and gradually. Absolutely. And what is your, um, you mentioned that Middle East and in Europe just now, uh, what is your distribution like? Out, I mean, uh, I was in, as I said, I was in Russia. I stopped by one of your stores in Moscow, but um, at least I've been to the United States. I haven't seen um, Raketa around as uh, as I see other brands. Uh, we see some secondhand models here in Brazil on the on the gray market. Um, what is your distribution like today? So we outside of Russia, uh, we are distributed in retail stores in France, in Switzerland, in uh, and, and and in the Middle East. We have six. We're, we're represented in six countries in the Middle East. And otherwise, in the rest of the world, we sell through internet. We have a very efficient internet um, distribution system where if you, for example, want to buy a Raketa watch, you would buy it from a European company and it would be delivered to you in three or four days by DHL free of charge from Europe. So basically, we, we, we produce the watches in Pittsburgh, we export them to our European company and then it's distributed worldwide. But Fantastic. otherwise, our strongest market, obviously, is, is Russia for the moment. Fantastic. And what is the price point? Just so you know, viewers can get an idea. Um, what is usually the price point of your watches? Uh, the price point is, is, is extremely interesting because you, you get a manufactured historic uh, watch uh, for an average retail price of 1,400 euros, uh, which, uh, which is honestly um, a, a very interesting price point uh, for what you get. Uh, because the, the Raketa mechanical movement, you will not find it anywhere else than in our brand. It's like Rolex ma makes its own movement for its own brands. We're a bit like that. Yeah, yeah. That's and how... and we, but as we have a big demand, by, by the way, from uh, brands who want to buy a mechanical movement, because as you know, it's quite difficult now to find mechanical movements. So we have a lot of demand, but we, 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 we never sell it to anyone else because First of all, our manufacturer cannot produce enough for what we need, but also we want to keep it a very exclusive movement for uh, only the Raketa brand. And people yeah. appreciate and people like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so you said you, you produce all your movements, basically every single component of yeah. the watch yeah. is produced in St. Petersburg. Yeah. Yeah. Of the mechanical movements, we produce it 100% ourselves, 100%. That's not, not it, me. Factories it, it, do that these days. Uh, I know, I know. Um, but, and we, we, and w as I said, you know, when we invite all of these, you know, watch specialists from Europe, for example, and we show them how we make the hairspring, they said, wow, it's amazing. We never saw that in Switzerland. Because the few companies that do that would never show it to you. Like Rolex would never, never, never let you in into the manufacturer. Or maybe they'll show. Or maybe they will show you like the assembly of the, the final assembly of the watch, but they will never show you how they produce anything. Uh, and it's and the, the monopoly as well. And the monopoly that Switzerland has, I mean, the uh, Swatch Group and Niva Rocks or something, they would, you know, they're not going to let other people just come in and, yeah, and yeah, do what they do. They, they, and in, in, in our case, we, we just let everyone in because um, it's a very good marketing tool. And, and basically, we're very proud of what we do. And, and honestly, you know, even if, you see how we produce the hair springs, for example, there's no way you can copy it. There's no way. Uh, so I, I don't really understand why they didn't show it. Um, but in any case, we show it and people love it. And so we've had so many Swiss uh, watchmakers who said, you know, there are a lot of operations that we saw in your factory that we never, never saw in Switzerland. 
That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. And visitors, one day we will show you how we produce. Um, I mean, whatever you want, you know, we will show you everything. But there are oh, no secrets. Yeah. No, I have no. Oh, I'm dying to go back. Uh, hopefully, I'll be back very soon. And unfortunately, I went to. Um, I didn't go to Saint Petersburg. Um, my trip was only in Moscow, in Volgograd, because of the documentary we were shooting. Uh, but um, yeah, so you have I mean, to come. You have to come. It's. It's honestly, it's one of the most beautiful cities in the world. It's. It's called. It's called the. Um, the, the um, it's like Venice. Have you been to Venice? In Italy? Uh, no. No, no, uh, I have it, but... it, it's it's a city that was built on water, so you have a really? lot of canals, a lot of canals. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fantastic. Um, it was built by, by the emperors, and it's still honestly, I've been to many many places. It's one mm -hmm. of the most beautiful cities in the world. That's fantastic. No, I'm dying to go. I mean, Russia was just such a uh, an amazing experience for me personally. So I'm I'm really hopeful to go back now. Um, Mr. Henderson Stewart, you if we just speak a little bit about you, because you mentioned that you 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 inherited and you took over Raketa around um ten years ago. Yeah. Um so that's not long in the in the watch business. I would imagine it's been a quite a a learning curve. Uh or were you already in the watch industry no, when you, no, you took no. over? I knew, just, uh, I knew nothing about watches, like nothing at all. I just liked the idea to to um reposition basically i moved to russia 20 years ago i was a lawyer i was a banker i did many many things and um i, I always thought that this country had an amazing culture and fantastic history and there was something about you know soviet design that's really really cool and i my idea basically was to find a soviet brand and to reposition it and to modernize it and because all of these soviet brands were dying and I didn't really want to go into Soviet watches, but I noticed that most of my friends who came to visit me wanted to buy Soviet watches. So I kind of quickly understood there was something about Soviet watches. And then I started digging and I found this amazing history. Basically, the Soviet Union had these huge manufacturers producing incredible watches that people still collect all over the world. Today, you have a lot of collectors of Soviet watches. And I discovered also, unfortunately, that most of these factories had collapsed, had died, because they didn't survive the difficult transition from a communist economy to a capitalistic economy. But there was one manufacturer left in, in St. Petersburg, so I took, I took a plane. I, I, and I discovered um, this amazing factory with this incredible 300-year history. Uh, they kept all of their production, production line, they kept all of the technical drawings, um then i discovered some very iconic designs like for example the, the, big, the big zero i discovered also some incredible complications like the 24 hour movements or the counterclockwise movements and i thought wow this is really really cool and but i was very naive obviously had i known anything about watchmaking i would never have started that but thank god i didn't know anything about watchmaking uh and that's how i started it but over these 10 years i had the temptation to shut down this manufacturer like a lot of times because you know but there's a reason why so few brands watch brands have their own manufacturers it's, just, it's like producing a mechanical watch is just nearly as complicated as sending a rocket into space it's very difficult and that's the reason why most of the swiss brands that you know don't have their own manufacturer that's the only reason it's very complicated and very expensive because even yeah. to produce one single mechanical watch, you need 80 specialists. And but I didn't know all of that. So uh Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. You were you're not Russian yourself. You um you moved to Russia a few years and um you um I moved to Russia because I, I was offered a job in Russia. Um and honestly the big advantage of living at that time, I mean, now it's very, because of the situation, it's very difficult to travel. But at that time, the big advantage of living in Russia is that it's a very exotic country, which is very, very different from our European culture. And at the same time, very close to our European culture. Uh, and also geographically very close. So I could fly back to England or to France for a wedding or for a dinner party. Now it's more difficult, but uh, what I loved in Russia was this contrast between, you know, this Asian culture, European culture. Um, it, it, it's very close to us, but very different from us. 
And you spoke about, you know, keeping some of the traditions alive. And um, apart from Raqueta, there are other brands as well that uh, are very much, you know, represent uh, not only Russia, but even that period of time, you know, that Yuri Gagarin went to space, like Vostok, for example. So what is the relationship with uh, Raqueta and Vostok? But I know that Vostok is, is in a different... Um, uh, so, Vostok, it, so Vostok is the second... Basically, there are two manufacturers that, that survived. It's Raketa in St. Petersburg and Vostok mm -hmm. in, in Tatarstan. It's in Russia. It's farther away. Um, we, so they still produce, they, they also produce their own mechanical watches, but at a very uh, lower price point. Basically, it's, um, it's much, I mean, basically, we took the positioning much higher in, in terms of um, design, manufacturing and all of that uh our, our ambition from day one was I, I thought that there was no reason why russian watches could not be at the same level as swiss watches i mean that was a crazy idea at that time that apart from me no one believed in but i, I thought well you know we have we have a manufacturer we have all of the machines the technical process technical drawings all the specialists we have the history the legacy uh, the, the history the legacy the traditions uh, incredible his, uh, stories to tell about space, uh, art, cool explorers. I mean, basically, that's one of the big advantages of having a Russian brand is that Russia is famous worldwide for these incredible human achievements in science, in art, in engineering, in in uh, in music, uh, in culture, and basically, a brand can. Uh, we can tell every single one of these stories, and that's a big advantage that we have over, you know, Swiss, for example. Um, and and I thought there's no reason why Raketa could not one day be at the same level as a Swiss brand. And the idea was always to have a distribution worldwide. So this is that this is um, what um, distinguishes us from Vastok. Just to answer to your question, Vastok still is more focused on the Russian market. Exactly. Yeah. No, and the quality as well. I mean, the price point of Vostok is uh, considerably lower, and the quality and the the, the elements, see, the composition is uh, completely different. But so, is there um, uh, the internal market of Russia of watches? Is it very busy? Is it very competitive? Well, do you have a lot uh, of brands from from other countries as well? Oh, yeah, do you have a lot uh, of Swiss uh, brands. Uh, well, not now anymore. Uh, most of the ah. Swiss brands have withdrawn from Russia since. Um, since a year ago yeah uh, but, but otherwise they, they were very much present and um w when i started raketa like the russians didn't really believe in raketa because they all wanted swiss brands uh but now the situation over the past 10 years has changed a lot because we've proven to the market that russian watches are interesting are qualitative um and and a very different from what you find in, in, in Switzerland. And a lot of people tell me, even when I go to these big watch fairs in Geneva, for example, they all say it's fantastic that you still exist because uh, without Raketa, the rush, uh, I mean, the watchmaking world would be m less interesting because, you know, people who love watches, they like the diversity in the, in the world of watches. And Russian watches have a different history, they have a different design, they have their own mechanical movements, which don't look like Swiss mechanical movements. And it makes the world of watchmaking much more interesting and, and rich. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, me on a personal level, I think watches do combine all that and they truly become a, a canvas for different artists to express everything that you said, you know, artistry, engineering, innovation, history. And uh, to see Raketa, um, you know, demonstrating all of the the russian uh, history it's just fantastic now um you came in into the watch i mean as i said 10 years it's not it's not long um how are things uh, is it are you happy with the the progression you've made because i imagine you had some obstacles along the way how um you know what are the biggest challenges you had to face um in the past well, few years on, on the learning process in the past few years, well, well, the biggest challenge was your first question. Basically, is is specialists. It's um, how do you find specialists? So we had to, we have to train them. We have to train them ourselves. I would say that was the biggest challenge. 
the other challenge was to prove to the markets that Russian watches are interesting. Uh, and for that, there was no, I mean, th th there's just one answer. You have to be very qualitative. I mean, quality is the most important. So uh, we spent a lot of time and energy modernizing the factory, not buying, you know, CNC machines, but, you know, improving the, the, the working environment, uh, the raw material that we use, um, and so on, so on, so on. But that was also very, very difficult. Uh, otherwise, uh, in terms of design, we are obviously, every single watch, one of our watches in our collection is inspired by the Soviet watches. So uh, we try to keep this tradition. Um, and that's why we, we have watches in our collection that look so much different from what you can see in elsewhere. We try not to copy the Swiss. Uh, design because that would not be interesting so we so that all of our watches have a big zero instead of a 12 they go counterclockwise they have 24 hour movements they tell the story of russian submariners or russian space conquests and so on and so on so what's we're, we're, we're trying to basically have very authentic russian watches in terms of production in terms of history in terms of storytelling we would never do a watch uh, uh, linked to golf, for example, like Code Marquigue, because golf is not Russian sport. Uh, so all of our watches are linked to Russian human achievements. And it has nothing to do with politics, you know, it's something that um, is, um, it's human achievements in, uh, in, in space, for example. Exactly, exactly. Uh, but how are things at the moment then? I would imagine that the past year or so have been very difficult for you Russia, know, the watch industry. They have, but surprisingly, uh, you know, the, the manufacturer is 300 years old. So it survived a lot of, you know, as I said, Russia's history is very chaotic. A lot of wars, a lot of revolutions, a lot of uh, crises. And, but our manufacturer has survived every single one of these uh, difficult wow. periods in history. So um uh, russians are very resilient as our watchmakers are very resilient so we will survive this difficult period which i hope will not last too long and um we will survive that there's no reason and we basically we, we continue doing what we always did is to tell interesting stories produce interesting watches and um we have nothing to do with politics you know and that's and people outside russia appreciate that and that's why our sales uh, haven't really dropped. Have you seen a, a rise in the demand for a racket in the past year or so? Yeah, or, of, course, of course, new, of course. Also a time of opportunity, I would imagine. Well, you know, nothing has really changed. You know, we are not a fashion brand that adapts to, to, to trends and fashions, you know. Uh, uh, so we just have a strategy, a very long term strategy, which we can consider, consider, continue to roll out. And uh, we try to ignore what's going on. Obviously, there are difficulties in terms of importing, exporting, um, but um, we every single day we overcome each one of these difficulties and we continue moving. Yeah. And ever since you started Raketa, um, I would imagine your whole perception of the, the watch industry has changed. Ooh. Speaking now on a global level and uh, some of the you know trends, if, if we can put it that way, of the watch industry, how do you see the watch industry going? Um, you know, what do you um, think of it? Um, well, what we do is very different from what the Swiss do. The Swiss they fight okay. on the level of complications, like brands try to to roll out new complications every single year. Uh, we don't have to do that. We don't do that for two reasons. The first reason is that we produce our own mechanical movement by ourselves. And that's already the most difficult thing that you can do. The base movement is the most. So we didn't have to prove that we are a manufacturer by inventing new complications that, that you add on the base movement all the time. We just have two complications. It's the 24 hour complication uh, because that's for, because we always did it. And it's very useful for people working in extreme conditions where you have difficulties determining the day from the night. It's like pole explorers submariners, cosmonauts. And the second complication that we have is the counterclockwise. That's an incredible complication where the hands go counterclockwise. And that's actually very difficult to do because you have to re-engineer your escapement and your and your barrel spring. 
And you can only do that when you produce the base mechanical movements. You cannot buy an ETA movement and reverse the time. It's like nearly impossible because you would have to re-engineer the escapement. So, um, so in the draws, I discovered a lot of other complications. We have the date, the double date, a power reserve, a alarm clock, but we are not anytime soon going to relaunch these complications because we don't need to do that. Because what we do is tell interesting stories about links to Russia. As I said, space, we make watches for cosmonauts, uh, Russian cosmonauts wear our watches at this very moment in the ISS. Uh, we make Russian watches for submariners, which submariners wear uh, at this very moment in, in submarines. So that's the level on which uh, we make our watches, is to tell incredibly interesting human stories. And I think that uh, today it's it's still very there's a huge potential because we live in a very depressive world, you know, with COVID and uh, the international financial crisis and this war going on and all of that. And you and I fundamentally in our hearts are still like boys. We, we need people to tell us interesting stories. And that's exactly what we do. We, we try to tell very interesting stories um, and with a lot of interesting content. And uh, so I think there's a, that it's, that's, uh, the potential is still very, very big. Fantastic. No, thank you. Thank you for that. That was amazing. Um, and on a, on a more personal uh, level, ever, ever since you started Raketa, have you started a watch collection or have you, uh, do you buy other watches or? <laughs> no, you know? I, ne I, I never, to tell you the truth, I never bought any watches before Raketa. I mean, my parents offered me a Tissot watch, a quartz Tissot watch when I was 18. And uh, and that was it. That, that, that was my only experience in, with, with watches. And today, obviously, I don't wear anything else in the raqueta. Uh, yeah. I buy them myself. I mean, my kids don't understand that. My kids don't understand that I just can't go into the in, into the factory and just take watches. No, I buy them. And I, I have a collection of raqueta watches because I really believe that. Um, uh, I mean, what I mean, watches is all about emotions, right? And all of my emotions in watchmaking are linked to Raketa because I know how difficult it is. I know how interesting it is. I know every single watch of every single one of our watchmakers. I know what amazing people they are because honestly, the factory survived thanks to them. Yeah. So we owe them a lot. And so it's a lot of emotions. And so that's why for me, the best watches in the world are Raketa watches. I mean, I, I do like other brands also, obviously, but for me personally, uh, I can even wear raketa watches. What about quartz movements? I, I forgot to ask. Do you uh, produce quartz movements, or the, was there any ever uh, quartz movement in uh, the, the They were. They were like, like everyone else in the seventies. They switched. I mean, they always continued making mechanical movements, but they always, they, but they also created. Um, um, how do you call them? Uh, it's, it's half mechanical, half quartz. They had oh, mecha, these, mecha quartz. Yeah, yeah. They had that, but then they stopped doing that. Uh, no, Raket is only mechanical because, um, because, because I mean, I would not do a Raketa watch with a Chinese or a Japanese mechanical, uh, a quartz movement. It would not make any sense to me because uh, in the DNA of Raketa, the, the Russia is the most important part. So, and, and, and also, uh, when you have um, a brand with a mechanical movement, you would not have a second collection with the same brand and a quartz movement. I, 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 it's it's two yeah. different it's, it's two different positionings. Yeah, yeah, it's, to it's completely, yeah. And um, how many? Um, you mentioned that you know you have um, there are other movements and other watches. What about the old raquetas, um, the one before your time? Are those still? Do you still sell them? Are they available? Um, no. What is this, the, the 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 second hand watches or raqueta? Oh, it's it's very big because they produce, as I said, more than five million mechanical watches every year. So you still have a lot of them in the market. Um, they were mostly manual watches. They only they only developed the the automatic complication in the big in the eighties. But then they okay. stopped because because uh, everything was collapsing and uh, automatic washes were just too expensive for, for the Russian market. So they stopped producing. They, they discontinued the, the production of the automatic movement. So basically, all of the Soviet watches that you can still find on the second market are manual watches. 
manual watches with, with, with plastic glass, um, uh, no ATM. Uh, but, but, but that's how people made watches, even in, in Switzerland, you know, in the 70s and the 60s. Um, yeah. But um, but the designs are very, very interesting. And um, uh, our designers uh, are inspired by all of these Soviet designs from uh, Rakete, from, from the Soviet times. Well, yeah, because I imagine the amount of models and, you know, five million a year, that's just unbelievable. You know, they had so many out the output that it has. Yeah. Uh, and the first time I visited the manufacturing in St. Petersburg, I, I saw a big box and I said, so what's in that box? And they said, we have no idea. So I opened the box and I saw incredible, uh, all the archives of the watercolors, because, you know, at that time, the designers, they didn't design on computers. They didn't have any computers. So today, today our designers they, they draw on computers directly. But that that time, designers drew uh, with, on with, paper. On, 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 yeah. So so I discovered all of these watercolors of all of these d Soviet uh, designs, and we have more than five hundred of these. <gasps> it's amazing. Um, next, if you do come, I'll, I'll show them to you. It's an amazing archive collection of, of designs. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, 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 for example, for, for this watch, I could pull you out mm -hmm. the original watercolor of this design, and it's signed by the designer. It has a date on it, and sometimes, and sometimes they also have instructions for the production. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that you don't see that everywhere. <laughs> Definitely a, a, a unique history, and a, I mean, it's just fantastic the work that you're doing on keeping it alive, and you know, keeping it in the forefront of your business. You know, maintaining this. The balance between the, art, the the integrity of the history, the legacy of what it has, and then also on the other hand, you have the commercial demands that you have to distribution and and, and all that. It must be difficult to to balance these two. Um, it is, but but I, I don't see Raketa as a business. I mean, for me, business is too commercial. It's all about m making money. It's so far away from Raketa. I mean. Um, but that's one of the big mistakes I did also. I thought, wow, well, uh, you know, uh, I mean, watchmaking is not about money. It's about uh, legacy, traditions, culture, interesting stories, uh, craftsmanship. Um, and, and it's good, you know, that's something you can be proud of. You know, some people are proud of making lots of money. Other people are proud of other things. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but, so, so, um... so, so, so whenever someone says, oh, how's your business going? For me, just, ah. Oh, it's not a business. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> business is vulgar. <laughs> yeah. What about the future? What are the plans for the uh, long term uh, when it comes to uh, Raketa? Uh, do you have any? Um, I mean, you mentioned that you just had a release uh, um, um, commemorating the plane, but do you have any models, maybe, or any? Of course, of course, of course. Um, we we are releasing like three or four models every year, so we still have two more models that we will release until the end of this year. Um, um one of them by the way is being is is, is a counterclockwise watch um must be uh, difficult so that, to read time on that one well it, it's 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 like you know driving learning to drive in engines and on the continents okay. uh it, it takes you two days to get used to it but then it's fine um anyone who buys one of our counterclockwise watches he, yeah it takes you to die uh, two days to get the hang of it, but then, then it's fine. And then when you wear it, it's so much, it's, it's very, it's, it's, if you go to a dinner party and, and you wear one of these counterclockwise watches, you ask your neighbor, you know, do you know how to read the time? He says, yes, of course. And then you show him the watch and then he starts, <laughs> and he doesn't understand. And then you start explaining to him why it's, why it's counterclockwise. There's a whole story behind that. Um, and it's very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah fantastic. So uh, two to three models per year. On the same production level or you tend to increase production um, we, every year we, as well? of, of course of course we try to increase um but that's the biggest challenge we have today is that the demand is higher than our production capacity so we are um, increasing the production capacity every year but not more than like 15 20 10 20 percent because uh as i said i don't want to put too much pressure on the manufacturer and then we have you know we don't have any as I said, you know, we train our watchmakers ourselves, so we can't hire two times more people. We have to do it. We have to train them ourselves. So it takes time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, do, just a curiosity: Do the, some of your watchmakers um, do they ever go to Switzerland? Do they uh, 
Do they get no. jobs there? Do they leave or no? no? no. Especially now, and it's impossible. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. No, it's a. Okay. <laughs> but but it, you, you you know what? Uh, when I discovered when I when I took over the Kirtan, I discovered that. So I, I invited all of these Swiss specialists to come and visit our factory, and, and they all said, "Wow, it's amazing! You do your own hairspring." And in Switzerland, barely no one does it. And I said, "Well, maybe there's a market for that. I could go to Switzerland and sell the uh, hairspring um, re-engineered for the ETA movement, for example." And we did it. It's not very difficult, and and no one wanted to buy it. And the reason was that. They said, in terms of quality, it's perfect. We could, you know, just plug it in immediately, and it would work, and it would be like twenty times cheaper than uh, Swiss escapements. But uh, the, the the reason why they said they couldn't do it is is in case the market had discovered that in a Swiss watch you have a, a, at the very heart of the mechanical movement is a Russian hairspring, it would just kill us. So uh, it's too good, man. You're, you're too good. <laughs> No one wants to buy a Russian uh, a, a, a Russian hairspring, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't matter. As, as you said, I mean, watches is, is emotion, and watches are a big part of a Swiss uh, legacy and history. So they'll they'll try to keep their uh, you know their their business or their traditions going at the same time. You know, but um, as I said, I was I, I I knew of the Russian watch history, but I had no idea that it has such a legacy. You know, and to to see it and um, was was fantastic and it's fantastic what you're doing. You know, keeping it alive and bringing these old values and traditions, but at the same time innovating and trying to adapt to uh, so many obstacles. You know, it's the it's not easy. It's a fantastic job you're doing, Mister uh, Hanson Stewart. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're very friends with Chaikin, uh, so you, I understand that you met Chaikin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and Konstantin Shaikin and Raketa will be together at the Geneva Watch Days and end of August in Switzerland. You know, it's a, one of the biggest, most prestigious watch fairs. Um, you going as a brand, or you be uh, setting up as a brand? Yeah. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, and so is Konstantin Shaikin. So, it, how are things to participate in this fair these days? It's okay. Um, no issues to go in and uh, no, set. no, no. That's great. Mm, no problem at all. Oh, fantastic. I will try to go, um, but it's, it's far away and uh, difficult to go to Geneva right now. But um, I will do my best to try to be there if I can. Oh, it's great. Um, what about the uh, other fairs like uh, Dubai Watch Week? Do you well, um, I went so last year I was in Sierra in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So Raketo also had a stand. So I totally understand you when you say it's far far away to travel to Russia. I, I because I've traveled to Mexico. It was very far away, uh, going through uh, Turkey or Dubai. I forget. Yeah. Uh, we also participate in um, in, uh, in uh, there's a watch fair in in, in Bahrain. There was uh, in in Dubai. Uh, so so we try to participate in every single watch fair. Especially now, it's important to be physically present to show our our watches even, even more so than than it used to be yeah yeah so so we try to be everywhere when it comes to um markets would you say europe or middle east is your main um well base? no a main market is europe uh but the middle east is picking up very very well basically we opened the middle east a year ago and now we have shops in bahrain qatar kuwait uh Jordan, Saudi Arabia. Uh, we even opened a shop in India. Wow. So, and uh, we we did some really uh, we did a collaboration with the Horror File. Um, so basically, we're, we're doing collaborations for the Middle East. We have two more collaborations coming out uh, before the end of this year. Um, so it's 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 a very interesting market for us. Absolutely. And uh, uh, obviously, Asia is also a big market, but we don't have enough watches. So that's the biggest problem we have. We don't have enough watches. So that's why we would not have the uh, the, the capability today of opening a new market, especially a big market like Asia. Oh, I can imagine. And um, CR, uh, what was that like? Was there any participation from South America? Uh, maybe the Latin countries? Was there uh, any contacts that you made with the uh, 
Of course, of course. Uh, but you know, it takes time because obviously not many people know about Raketa. It took us, it took us really 10 years to, to consolidate the European market and to reach a good amount of sales. Uh, so obviously Latin America and Mexico will also take a lot of time, even more so because they know even less about Russian watches than Europe did. Uh, but uh, what I in Mexico, I discovered an incredible market. People love watches. They're very passionate about watches. Uh, I discovered very passionate people. Uh, actually, to to big extent, very close to uh, very similar to Russians. Like Russians can also be very passionate about things. Yeah, and and very and, like and, and very open. Also, it was so interesting to see people coming to the stand and asking questions and uh, with a lot of emotions. It's uh, it's very different from, for example, European fans. Yeah. People That's are different it. in Europe. Well, maybe maybe Brazil will be on your list one day. Maybe you come down to Brazil. Have you been to Brazil? Never, unfortunately, never. Yeah, it's, I'd it's love a to. Good country. Yes, it's very in a way similar to Russia. I would say in uh, the people. Uh, you said that you know they just get on with things, and uh, we Brazilians we are kind of like that sometimes as well. So. I'd love to. Honestly, I would. Um, last question, and um, I'll leave you uh, on your... It's probably getting late there for you as well. So, considering your professional and your personal experiences, um, how would you define time? A time is the most precious asset that we have in life. You know, with all the money in the world, you cannot buy an additional second. Um, Time is, we are totally obsessed by time. Uh, it's a very sacred concept. You know, if you if you study the history of timekeeping, you will see that time was always linked to astrology, uh, linked to gods. You know, time uh, has its own, had its own god, Kronos. So it's a very sacred um, concept, which is very important to us uh, because, um, as I said, it's so precious to us. And at the same time, it's very difficult to define. You know, if I ask you, can you give me a definition of time? It's, it's nearly impossible. What's the definition of time? I've tried many times to uh, to give a definition. It's very, very difficult. I looked it up in a dictionary and I still can't really understand it. And um, But we are totally obsessed by time. I, you know, we check our watch or, a or, or, or the or the time on our computer, like, I don't know, more than 100 times every single day. And that's not very good, I think. M maybe we should try to make times a bit slower. <laughs>